Hi, I'm Mary Mohan, um, and uh, this is the talk that I was originally supposed to be giving in person, um, but unfortunately uh, I'm not able to make it up to the festival this year. So um, by the power of technology, um, I am now beaming into your devices. Um, so this is a talk about, as it says, the Squatia Lupi Codex, and I've subtitled it um, Plague, Power and Song in Trecento, Florence, uh, because the more I kind of looked into the context of this codex, the more interesting the kind of uh, environment really was. Um, and now looking at that through a kind of lens of uh, having you know, lived through 2020 and 2021, uh, first half of um, and COVID and all that kind of stuff and how the arts have responded to those kind of things. I think it's um, it's quite pertinent in some ways. So anyway, let's make a start. So the Squatio Lupi Codex um, is basically it's the largest anthology of secular Italian Trecento music. By Trecento, um, it, 13, 1300s, not 13th century, um, and kind of uh, is bracketed between sort of 1320 to 1420, 25-ish. Um, so musically, stylistically. Um, it was compiled in Florence uh, in the early 15th century, and it was owned by a chap called Antonio Squacciolupi. And uh, don't you just love that name? I can't, I can't stop myself saying it. Squacciolupi, it's great. Um, and we're going to learn a little bit more about him later. The codex contains 14 composers. Um, each one, as you can see here, has an illuminated portrait um, and the page is, you know, beautifully decorated all around the edge. Um, bear in mind, this is a 15th century set of portraits of mostly 14th century composers. So the likenesses are unlikely to be exact, not that we'll ever know. Um, and even things like the clothing that they're portrayed in, there may be some kind of uh, um, inaccuracies in terms of era, um, but that's just an aside really. Of those 14 composers, two of them have absolutely no music in here. They have pages of blank ruled staves. In fact, there are quite a lot of pages of blank ruled staves in this book. Um, clearly what's happened is that the uh, scribe who has um, been organising it, uh, or has been given the task of organising it, has kind of set aside uh, a certain number of folios per um, composer, has uh, marked them all out, lined out um, all those staves. Notice the staves are six line staves, not four or five. A um, little bit confusing to read as a consequence. Um, and have sat and, you know, waited for the music to arrive and either some things just never turned up, as in the case of the two missing composers, um, or just there was a, a miscalculation as to how much space it was going to take. Um, So we have 216 parchment folios, uh, quickly multiply that by four, you've got 864 pages in this book. So this is a substantial tome. Um, I've obviously never seen it, I would love to see it. Uh, there is a uh, two and a half thousand euro uh, facsimile copy that's been produced, which looks amazing, but I think I'll have to save my pocket money for a bit longer. Um, there are 350 compositions in total in there and each composition is complete and again that's quite unusual you often get kind of bits and pieces in these things um 
either sort of, you know, little scraps that have been added in at another time or um, something that just, you know, has been started and never finished. This is a really carefully put together book. Um, all of the music in it is secular. They're all songs. They are ballate, madrigals and catcher. Of those 354, almost half, 146, are by Francesco Landini. He is by far and away the most prolific composer represented in this book. So Antonio Squacciolupi, you can see his dates there. He is a 15th century um, organist. Uh, he was actually born into a family of butchers uh, and was a licensed butcher. That would have been his kind of childhood, young, um, young adulthood training. But his real talent lay in music. Um, he was the organist at a place called Orsan San Michele in 1431 for a couple of years. Um, and that's a name we will come back to. Um, he then got the post as organist at Florence Cathedral from 1433 until he died. Um, he seems to have moved in very lofty uh, circles musically, uh, appears to have um, written, um, exchanged letters with um, Guillaume de Fay um, and other such people. Um, so uh, he is the man with the name on the on the codex. So Trecento Florence. Florence was, during the first half of the Trecento, um, the largest and wealthiest city in Europe. Um, one of the Boniface popes, bon Boniface VIII, um, referred to Florence as, as the fifth element, um, not a science fiction film in this instance. Um, and it was really kind of an economic powerhouse. Um, it was an independent city state, as many places in Italy were. Uh, so it wasn't under the rule of Rome. It wasn't under the rule of a monarch. Um, but interestingly, I think it had no university until the mid 14th century. So during this time where it was really growing in power, there was no academic institution um, for for young men. Instead, young up and coming Florentines um, would enter a guild. They would go to abacus school and learn to do their accounts and all that kind of thing. And they would learn how to make money, basically. It was a place of commerce. So the guild and the merchant class were really the movers and shakers at this time. At the same time, there was a big rise in what was what were known as mendicant orders. Um, these were mostly Francis Franciscans and Dominicans. Um, and they were um, religious communities who rejected the monastic model, um, rejected the idea that the best thing you can do as a, for, with a religious life is to cloister yourself away and protect yourself from the evil world. But instead, they felt that their calling was to go and live amongst the poorest. Um, to to live in very built up urban places. And actually, you know, I have friends in the Franciscans who do that now. I mean, it's not something that's that stopped happening. Um, but they were a bit of a wild card. And I suspect um, the uh, the institutional church probably found them a bit tricky. Um, they were preaching really quite radical socialist ideas. Um, part of the Franciscan order, uh, a particular sect, you know, they didn't believe in private property. Um, so we're getting this interesting melting pot of um, real capitalist ideals, but also communist ide ideas beginning to bubble up. Um, and I think that the reason that these two things both were happening in this place at the same time is that these are the ideas of people who can make their own choices. 
they're 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 playing with what it what it is to be self regulated to be um self determined they're not under the authority of somebody else and they're they're working out how to build a society so within this um, mendicant preaching um thing comes the rise of uh, lay worship um so instead of what we might imagine worship to be like in this period of time and certainly you know what existed in england up until you know well right the way through the reformation and and um on to um when english became um the language used in church um rather than worship being conducted by the priest on behalf of the congregation what you were seeing in places like florence was non-ordained people lay people doing it themselves and what my little uh camera bit is covering up my little picture there is the the line formation of companies companies not uh, not um commercial companies we're not talking about businesses here but a company of people a group generally men although there were women companies as well and these companies um were a religious grouping So the Florentine companies, uh, they formed during the late uh, 13th and early 14th centuries. So from sort of about sort of 1270 onwards. And um, they were encouraged and tutored by the mendicant preachers, mendicant orders. And they fell into two groups. Um, and if you've read the Ken Follett second book, um, I've forgotten it was good, World Without End, um, which uh, deals with this period, but obviously in England, there is a little section in there that talks about this um, itinerant preacher, um, itinerant priest, who's kind of stirring up hysteria amongst the locals when the plague arrives, um, and they're tearing their clothing and they're, you know, acting almost as though they're drunk um, and you know beating themselves, and and it's really all very frowned upon. Well, that's the disciplinati. <laughs> in this instance so they were a flagellant group um they would demonstrate their uh, commitment to the church to commitment to christ specifically um by beating themselves by self-flagellation but then there were also the laudesi and they're the ones we we're interested in because the laudesi worshipped through song these groups were utterly autonomous they they didn't have you know a priest in charge or a monk who told them what to do they were educated by the monks but they organized themselves so it was a real grassroots spirituality um they performed charitable service to the poor um they conducted their own services even which i think you know if you tried doing that in england um you'd probably be had up for for heresy in or something um and i suspect in many other places spain for example um i can't imagine that going down terribly well there either um so they yes conducted their own their own services um so it's very much a period of um being able to buy your salvation either through charitable giving or good works or you know commitment of your life um and so that's the kind of the, the lens to look at this through. One of the biggest powerhouses at the time for this company worship this lay worship was a place called or san michela osm as it would be referred to later um, it became during the second half of the trecento the most powerful and wealthiest hub of merchant activity both spiritual and commercial so this is a very 
interesting juxtaposition, I, I think. Um, it's got an unusual name. It was built on the site of a 9th century um, monastic garden, an oratory. Um, so it's the Auto, the oratory, um, San Michele for the, St. Michael's Monastery. Um, so that's, and it just Florentine um, dialect just contracted the whole thing and it became the Or San Michele. In 1290, the site that had that was now derelict um, was bought and they built a wooden um, loggia style grain market. So open arches um, with a roof on the top. But being wooden, you know, it burnt down as these things do. In um, 1336 to 37, uh, it was rebuilt in brick. And at some point after that first floor was, was built, um, the second two stories uh, were added to include offices and then a granary on the top. So the granary was the, the grain store was on the very top of the building, which kept it safe from flooding, um, from riots, um, probably helped to keep some of the pests out as well, that kind of thing. So how did a building that was built for uh, civic use for uh, as a grain market become associated uh, as a place of um, as a religious centre? Well, when um, in its earliest form as the wooden loggia, there was a little image um, and it was the image of the Madonna del or San Michele and it was probably just a little wooden plaque um, nailed onto one of the um, pillars that supported the roof and this little image became associated with miracles and as such people came from far and wide to venerate the image to um, ask for blessing to ask for cures um, they would um, swear oaths in front of it, um, both, I guess, you know, private oaths and promises, but also would be used in a kind of more public sense. And even after the loggia burnt down in 1304 and the little wooden image um, was destroyed, people kept coming. Uh, despite there being no image left, people still came to the place where the image of the Madonna had been. And so after the uh, brick loggia was built, uh, a few years after, about 10 years after, uh, a new painting was commissioned by Bernardo Dadi. And if you look to the left of the slide, you can see uh, a photo of that painting uh, that is still on display in the All San Michele. There you can see the Madonna um, in a black cloak lined with red with the child Jesus on her knee sitting on a throne and she's got the angels adoring around her. And then if you look at the second image, what you can see there is that same picture, the same painting portrayed within a scene of the market itself. So there are um, big baskets of grain, there are people trading, um, there looks like possibly some kind of riot going on outside. Um, certainly there are soldiers, um, guards maybe, um, and there is the Madonna and child situated within uh, a stone um, sculpture, stone um, edifice, which was the tabernacle that was built in 1349. By the time we got to the 1380s, the religious traffic in uh, Orsan Michele was so disruptive of the market that the market was moved to a new place. Um, and at that point, uh, Orsan Michele became a dedicated worship space. Um, and gradually over the next few decades, the uh, loggia arches were filled in, were bricked up. 
um, and uh, it became uh, a place predominantly of worship. The 1340s in Florence um, were a difficult period of time. It, I mean, I would describe it, as I put on the slide, as a decade of disaster. Uh, in 1340, there was an, uh, an unnamed epidemic. In 1341, there was war with Pisa, a, name, uh, a nearby neighbouring city. In 1343, there was civil unrest that actually culminated in the public murder of um, the chief of police and his and his son. There was a massive flooding in 1345, followed the next year by a financial crisis. The year after that, there was famine and then in 1348, the, the, the Black Death arrived, the plague. Um, Florence was hit devastatingly by the plague um, and estimates at the loss of life go between 45 and a and a just unbelievable 75% of the population. Um, you know, you just can't imagine how terrifying it would be to live in a city where three quarters of the people around you are dying or have died. Um, just horrifying. So the Laudese company of Orsan Michele um, became one of the wealthiest in Florence, a very influential group of people. And it quite frankly benefited massively from the 19, 19, 1348 plague. That plague fueled religious fervor, um, as I'm sure you can imagine. And Pilgrimages, donations, gifts, new members all kind of flooded or San Michele and really swelled their coffers and their ranks. The or San Michele building and, and the company filled this kind of dual role. Um, it was both civic and religious. It was obviously a place to meet members of other guilds, members of your company, probably, you know, make agreements, uh, commercial agreements, um, but it was also a place of, of praise and worship. And it was entirely funded and organised by the Laudese Company. They were a um, completely lay group. There were, there were no ordained members among them. Um, and one of the things that they spent their money on was commissioning statues for their patron saints. So if you um, remember the image, the, the photo of the outside of the building, there are um, sconces in there with um, statues. Uh, most of them are still there at the moment. They're being gradually uh, taken down, refurbished, um, restored rather, and uh, replaced with uh, copies so that the originals can be kept inside and safe. And these statues uh, would be part of the um, religi religious observance. So uh, on saints days of a particular guild patron saint, then the, the lauda would be sung for that particular saint. So the Laudese Company's purpose, other than their charitable works and uh, running the building itself, was to sing, hence their name. A lauda, this is according to Grove, um, was a non-liturgical religious song in the vernacular. There we go. Um, 
I mean, actually, it calls it non non liturgical, but but the way they were being used uh, in places in Florence was actually in a uh, in a liturgical but lay um, manner. So within a service that's written, hence liturgical, but not being run by uh, a priest. They kind of start appearing in the late 13th um, century and uh, they are at this point just a monophonic line, so a single line song. Uh, quite easy to learn as a consequence. Um, quite similar, I suppose, to the sort of Gregorian style stuff that we might be familiar with. Um, and they were used in the daily ferial services, um, generally the sort of end of the day um, service, which would be about the same time as, as we would have Compline. And then for feast days, saints days, um, there'd be a more elaborate um, version of the louder used. Um, just yeah, everything sort of made that bit more special for the day. As the century progressed, and the Laudesi companies became uh, wealthier and able to employ musicians and um, weren't just reliant on doing all the singing themselves. So the Laude themselves became uh, more complex. Um, so instead of being a single line, you now have two part songs. So line A, line B, um, sung at the same time and they tended to follow um, in a relatively loose way the ballata structure. Um, the ballata is a is a dance song very much like um, the English uh, carol. So you have a communal refrain um, that's relatively easy to sing and then you have the strophe or verse that is a bit more complex and how, where the text changes that you're not all expected to memorise, but is, is led by, um, by the singers. Ballata was um, a song, dance song form that was basically the pop music of the time. Um, this was this were these were songs that were sung domestically, um, socially, and of course, as we know, they were used by the Laudesi. Uh, they would be tunes that they probably already knew, which I guess is why they started using them. And this um, kind of rise of social music among the middle classes was something that was um, quite unusual, I guess. Florence at this point was so wealthy and so well established that the merchant class were now able to actually spend leisure time. They they were able to follow a hobby, um, commit their time to the arts or, you know, letters or, or in this case, music. Um, and we can see this in there's um, a, um, a piece of writing, the, the Decameron, um, which tells a story of uh, some Florentines who've, who've left the city um, during the plague um, and they're kind of holed up uh, on a hillside in a nice villa somewhere. Um, and it just kind of goes through their domestic life and um, that kind of thing. And there are um, bits of music that are talked about through this, you know, that, that um, uh, somebody was invited to sing something and he was like oh no I couldn't possibly sing something and then um they persuade him to do so and, and it's but you know and, and very often the, these are all ballata um they were the song of the time um and as it says on the bottom of this slide uh, we have 154 works by Landini still surviving of those 141 are all ballate um he, he wrote madrigals and catchers as well, um, and he probably wrote other stuff, but we don't have it. But 141 out of 154 are all ballata. Um, this was the song of the era, um, the, the, the form of the time. It was it was the rock and roll of the Trecento, if you like.
So Landini's Ballate are all collected in the Squatchy-Lupi Codex, and they're all complete. Uh, so we have uh, all of it there. Um, they're also in, in other, uh, some other manuscripts as well, but uh, not in the same numbers. Um, and the thing that's kind of special about Landini's work, which is probably why they were as popular as they were at the time, is they're very rhythmic. You know, if you think of Echo La Primavera, it's just, it's catchy, isn't it? You know, it just makes you want to move. You want to join in. Um, it's a bit of an earworm, which is exactly what songwriters, you know, throughout the centuries, right up to the present day and and at, will continue beyond. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for something that's going to get in your head and stay there. Um, and I think that was, you know, really Landini's skill um, was creating these tunes that just don't let go. Unlike music of previous centuries, the melody is always in the top part. Um, so if you think back to uh, when um, we did the, the music from the um, William Marshall era. Um, most of that music either is single part or the melody, the known line, is in the tenor line. And then the, um, the lines above, Cantus and Superius, um, will have been uh, embellishments on that um, in harmony, or not always in harmony, but, but um, the, the simplest um, line is also the tune. Now in Landini's Ballate, the, the tenor line is also the simplest line, but it's no longer the tune. It's a harmony line, and that's a real switch uh, between the previous centuries, but the Ars Antica um, and, and the Ars Nova or the Trecento, as we call it with Italian music. Um, it's interesting looking at the way these things, the way these ballate are written out, because in a lot of them, there is text very carefully written beneath the, the, the notation for both lines. So for superior and tenor, you have text, therefore implying clearly both lines are to be sung. But there are also ballate where the tenor line is without text. Or you get the ballate in a different manuscript, um, written out the same way, except that the tenor line now doesn't have text and has also been simplified. So repeated notes have been removed. Um, some of the ones where there is no text associated with the second line, with the, with the lower line, they're, they're not really singable lines. They have awkward or almost impossible intervals to sing. Something that you could do very easily on, organ, you know, on a portable organ, a portative organ um, or on a string instrument or a lute but with a voice would be really challenging um, and when you think that these are popular songs challenging is not necessarily what you're looking for they're not virtuous virtuosic things so there is an implication here that those lines are expected to be instrumental um, and even where you've got text in both parts you've got this this great thing where all the words are in both parts so it doesn't matter if if you don't have a, a a singer who available to do the second part because you just stick it on an instrument it'll be fine because you've got all the words in the other part anyway um so just in the way these these tunes are uh, recorded gives us an idea as to how they might have been performed So one of the reasons I think that the Laude, Laudesi companies chose the Ballata, other than the fact that they were well known um, and, and singable, was that they had quite a predictable structure. So it's very easy to, to get your mate, the poet, to write some, um, you know, great religious words to fit a known structure. And you just go, ah, that's brilliant. That'll fit to this one. 
marvellous. Um, so the, the music is kind of palindromic in, in structure. So you get an A section, a B section, the B section is then repeated, and then you have the A section again. But what's interesting is the text doesn't do that. So the text goes straight through A, B, C, D, as you can see on the slide. And most of them just have one, um, one verse, if you like, one, one strophe. Um, so the way this would be done uh, within a group, within a within um, a laude situation or within a domestic situation or social situation is that everybody would join in A. That's the chorus. That's the bit you all kind of take part in. And then those who are kind of performing the song or leading the worship would then do the next three lines. So to the tune of B, B and then back to A, but the text of B, C and D. And the great thing about this is, you know, when you're supposed to be coming in again because you hear the melody that you're about to sing. So once they get to that line and they sing that the, the, the chorus tune, but with different words, you're like, ah, right, OK we're in next um then in the few that have two or three um verses then exactly the same thing happens so you then go a b b a again so the the chorus text re response text um on the first line and then the next set of texts e f and g but using that b b a uh, notation again So how do we know that the Laudesi companies sang their laude to the Bellate? Because we have sources. Uh, there are extant manuscript and printed sources, uh, printed because this tradition continued for a good 200 years. You know, so by that point, printing was, was a technology that was well, much more widespread. And of the ones that we have, around 50, uh, sorry, 65, um, contain the phrase cantasi come. Please excuse my uh, diabolical Italian accent. I have never learned Italian. Uh, my only Italian comes from having learnt music um, and being able to say, you know, allegro or <laughs> um, such things, staccato. Um, anyway, cantasi come basically means sing it to this. So it's a cantasi, come, and then the title of the ballata that it was referencing. Um, most of these ballata, ballate are um, in the Squatchalupi Codex, of which the lion's share are all by Landini. And there's one that appears more than once um, to, to different texts, La Bionda Terza. Um, and that's one that I'm going to try, I'm going to insert um, as a recording. One of the most wonderful things about this merchant involvement in music as far as we are concerned in the 21st century is that merchants keep records they keep their accounts they you know they're, they're used to handling and maintaining pieces of paper and so we know how many musicians the or san michaela employed at certain times and we also know how they organized their sunday school and um, their uh, louder processions we know that at one point they had up to 12 singers on the books. They had lute players, rebec players, VL players. Notice, uh, particularly string players, that rebec and VL are two different instruments um, specified here, played, uh, you know, within the same group, but by different people and player of harp as well. Um, 
later on uh, they also had organ uh, they would probably have had portative organ anyway but by the time uh, in the 15th century they there was then um, an organ um, installed singing was generally led by a pair of singers and these would generally be um, a pair of brothers or a father and son and would have instrumental accompaniment and we'll kind of come back to that and the Laudesi singing was processional so um, they would process to the uh, image of the Madonna on the pillar as she was known um, and sing whilst processing and while standing in front of the Madonna and on major feast days that would be that those numbers would be swelled by freelance singers and uh, extra musicians including the municipal wind and brass players of the city uh, effectively the city weights as we would call them um, in England and again on feast days of the particular guilds then uh, the procession would um, make particular stop at, at that saint um, and obviously pray for their um, benefit on on the years uh, trading to come or the crops or whatever was appropriate for that particular guild Now, professional Laudese um, were an interesting bunch, I think. Um, there were many freelancers in, in Florence at the time, and there would have been in other cities as well. Um, but they weren't kind of trained musicians. We're, we're not talking about the, um, you know, the, the troubadours and trouvères uh, of uh, 12th and 13th century France. Um, they're not men from privileged backgrounds or from well-educated backgrounds these are from the lower merchant classes they're bakers and carpenters and barbers and i mean you can see the list lots of people involved with the wool trade which was one of the reasons florence was as uh, wealthy as it was and freelancing was uh, a way of supplementing their income um, some did go full-time but uh, as is the case now and as then it wasn't especially lucrative um, but you know if uh, you preferred to spend your day singing rather than uh, cutting people's hair um, and you could survive doing that then go for it quite frankly So members of the company um, weren't expected to simply automatically know the laude that were going to be chosen for the week. Um, there was weekly Sunday school on Sunday afternoon um, that would uh, provide a, a space and a time for the company members to learn the laude. And this was all organised by somebody called the governor. And um, the governor, it's, there's a little description here um, that I'm going to read to you. Um, this is a quote from somebody uh, contemporary, um, and I'll, I'll put all the uh, references at the end. Um, the duty of the governors of the Laude is to arrange and order how the Laude are to be sung every evening before the image of Our Lady on the pillar. So this is specifically your Saint-Michel, beneath the loggia. And to conduct the school on Sundays to learn the Laude and for which reason they themselves are to learn to sing the laude. That's convoluted. But basically, the governor has a duty to know all the laude. He, need, he needs to be able to sing them all so that he can teach them to the members of the company so that every evening they can stand in front of the Madonna del, um, or Saint Michel, Michaela. I always pronounce it incorrectly, sorry. It looks French and I know it isn't. Um, and, and sing the laude every evening um, in front of that pillar um, and obviously this is specific to or san michela but um, similar uh, sunday schools and governors would have existed in other institutions in the city
So how does the Squadulupi Codex fit into all of this? What we know is that Antonio Squadulupi was a very fine organist um, and he was organist, organist at the Orsan Michela for two years. But I think that is too tenuous a link to suggest that um, that that is why the book was compiled, that it was a, uh, a tune book specifically for the company uh, of Orsan Michela. We also know that the Codex contains many tunes referenced uh, by surviving louder texts, that it is full of popular secular ballate as well as um, cachias and madrigals. Whether or not it was for use uh, by the company of Orsan Michaela, it doesn't really matter, I don't think. It's incredibly carefully compiled. It, the same scribe uh, has done the work throughout. It's a very, very regular hand. Uh, there's no kind of sudden changes of style or handwriting. It's been very carefully planned, um, beautifully executed, and as we said at the beginning, um, is chronological by composer, which again is very unusual for codexes of this time. Um, you know, often they're they're much more of a kind of collection of of music that a certain person has sort of uh, collected over their time and have decided to have bound in a book. This is very much um, a deliberate collection of popular music. So although we can't say there's a definite link with Orsan Michaela, um, I still think it's likely that this particular codex was assembled for Laude singing use, or Laude learning use. Um, because it's not the kind of music that one would necessarily keep for posterity in, in other circumstances, I, I, I suspect. Well, thank you for listening. Um, and uh, I believe we now have a, a Q&A uh, that will be done live, so long as all our technology works. Um, the final slide is uh, my list of references. And also, um, after a slight pause, um, there will be uh, the track that I hoped to embed in uh, an earlier slide um, of uh, La Bionda Trezza. Uh, it's the David Munro recording. I, I listened to a few different ones and a lot of them, quite frankly, are a bit stuffy. Um, and that's not the style I think that Balate would have been um, performed in. The, this is, you know, music of the people. So although this is a recording from 1969 and and clearly things have changed in the intervening decades. Uh, I think it really does give a flavour of the sort of uh, popularity of this music. So I hope you enjoy that and I shall speak to you shortly.